Ukraine's offensive is over, which means now we got to look at what the next phase of this war is going to look like. And a challenge for Ukraine is that they're going to have to figure something out over the next few months that none of their allies have any experience with. That's something that Jack Watling hit on in a recent article for Rusi titled, Ukraine Must Prepare for a Hard Winter. Now, Watling has been an incredible resource throughout this war. Anytime he puts something together, either an analysis or a prediction of where it's headed, 100% somebody worth checking out. Now, when I say the offensive is over, you're not going to get that in an official release from the Ukrainian government. It's not in their benefit to put a bow on this thing and say, that is the 2023 spring-summer offensive. That's what it accomplished. It just doesn't do anything for Ukraine. Uh, realistically, though, if we look over the last couple of weeks, it's still a very kinetic battlefield, still a very deadly battlefield, but just have not been substantial Ukrainian pushes now for some time. Now, what Watling gets into here is the reconstitution of forces. And it's not just a challenge for Ukraine, but Russia has this issue as well. He says the Ukrainians now face a difficult set of competing imperatives to maintain pressure on the Russians while reconstituting their units for future offensive operations. And when I say this is something that Ukraine's allies haven't dealt with, that's kind of been a saying of critics from the beginning, right? The United States, Great Britain, anybody can't advise Ukraine on fighting this war because we haven't fought a modern peer adversary like Ukraine is up against with Russia. We haven't fought an adversary like Russia with this volume of firepower and the airspace being contested. But realistically, there's a lot of stuff that we plan for and we train for, and we can kind of simulate that through training exercises. This part is an entirely different beast. How do you pull forces off of the front to retrain, reequip, and get them set for some sort of future operations when they're needed everywhere? Now, they say the Ukrainian units committed to the front struggle to be pulled far enough from the Russians to train at larger scale. Russia, meanwhile, is having to commit many of its replacement troops to keep up the strength of its units at the front because of its high rate of casualties. So again, a challenge that both units are facing. Unless these Ukrainian units are moved out of the country, they are in range of Russian long-range missile strikes or drone strikes. Uh, the Russian troops, conversely, their challenge is the attrition rates are so high that in order to maintain some degree of defensive posture all across the front, they can't pull too many people out. Now, Russia could pull those troops to an area where they're not in you know, direct strike range of Ukrainian munitions, even the Storm Shadows and the Atakums, but that's getting further and further back into Russia. But at least they have that capability. Ukraine... Again, unless they're moved out of the country, there's not really a good place for Ukraine to train brigade-level operations. It's just, it's not there. Which has led to what Watling says here, that both Russia and Ukraine have struggled to generate offensive combat power in 2023. Ukrainian forces have been restricted to company-scale operations, and Russia has similarly struggled to synchronize and coordinate larger-scale activities, but this has not prevented it from attempting them at great cost in personnel and material. So I'm going to pull up a couple maps here from uh, today and from the start of the year, January 1st, 2023. And there's been a lot of fighting. The lines have changed in some areas. But if you zoom out just a little bit, you can see that the overall change in territorial control is very minor. I mean, yes, Russia had success taking Bakhmut. Uh, they've recently kicked off additional offensive operations around Abdivka, and they've made more gains in a few you know, a couple weeks here than they did in previous months, but big picture, it's just not a lot. Ukraine also made progress. They pushed back in some areas around Bakhmut. They gained territory around Vyelka Novoselka and Orhiv. But again, just zoom out a little bit and you can see how little of a change that has been in the overall frontline positions. I mean, there's a real argument throughout military history that the longer a war goes on, the quality of the forces just continues to degrade, right? So on the one hand, you have more experienced troops, uh, but a lot of those experienced troops at the beginning, they get killed off and they're not able to continue the fighting six months, 18 months, five years into the war. And it's not unrealistic that that's what we're seeing both in Ukraine and in Russia. But first, a quick thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Sonoran Desert Institute. If you've ever wanted to learn more about gunsmithing, firearms repair, or shooting sports management, SDI is worth checking out. They have online programs that cover armors courses, gunsmithing, ballistics, woodworking and finishes, shooting sports management, and more. Plus, tools and materials are shipped to your door for hands-on practice. SDI is DEAC recognized and can be a great way to kickstart a career you're actually interested in. Visit sdi.edu or call 480-999-4767 to learn more. 
A big problem here for both sides is that it's not enough to just maintain a defensive posture. You have to have enough forces nearby to where your adversary thinks there's a real chance that you could kick off some sort of offensive operation. I mean, if you look back to last year, the months leading up to Ukraine's offensive, Watling says the lack of a threat of offensive action by the armed forces of Ukraine allowed Russia to build three extensive defense lines with mines, trenches, and obstacles, which made Ukraine's offensive operation this summer an order of magnitude more difficult. So Russia had the time. I mean, there was no real talk for months there of a Ukrainian offensive. The earliest people were putting it was in the spring, but it was well known that these these Western capabilities and the training being conducted outside of Ukraine, that wasn't going to be done in March or April. By May and June, people started to think maybe it'll kick off any time now, but Russia knew that they had a period of time where they could, rather than having to go on the offensive, they knew it was coming and they could put their energy into building these defensive lines, which are formidable. If, I don't think that's in question anymore, right? It was kind of laughed at at one point, but at this point, seeing how challenging it has been for Ukraine to uh, bypass or go through them in certain areas, that was a problem. Allowing Russia that time was a problem. Now, that doesn't mean that Ukraine has to continually be on the offensive over the next few months or they're going to fail. That's you know unsustainable and not realistic. But even things like random company-sized raids could be enough to keep the Russians on their toes. If that's not going to do the trick, of course, you've got artillery fires. And, and Watling gets into that because there is a bit of a short-term imbalance here. He says, sufficient ammunition to sustain this rate of fire in terms of Ukraine having local fire superiority in some areas of the front, specifically in the south. He says, is not going to be forthcoming as NATO stockpiles deplete and production rates for ammunition remain too low to meet this level of demand. For now. More on that in a second. He says, not only is Russian domestic ammunition production rising rapidly, but new ammunition production is being supplied from Iran, North Korea, and other states. Again, true. That's a short-term fix. Uh, the challenge here really is that Russia is ramping up their domestic production faster than uh, the than Ukraine's NATO allies. Uh, so again, short-term, Russia has that fix of Iran, North Korea, and other countries providing ammunition, whereas the Western stockpiles are starting to uh, be depleted. However, he says, bottlenecks in spare barrels and other critical parts will prevent Russia from establishing fires dominance for the next quarter, while NATO production should increase later in 2024. But for a while, Ukraine faces the challenge of maintaining Russian attrition without an abundance of artillery. It's also worth mentioning the continued or the question of continued military support for Ukraine. I know there's been a lot of turmoil here in the United States. Uh, and the next major aid package to Ukraine has not yet been approved. Uh, I don't think that's really in question for what it's worth. Uh, personal opinion. But the amount of bipartisan support across Congress right now is still in favor of providing Ukraine what they need to repel and eventually defeat the Russian forces. So maybe over the long term, maybe over the next couple months or years, you start to see a, a decrease in U.S. support. But I don't think that is in question in the short term. He says the one plausible path towards Russia gaining a decisive advantage on the battlefield is if its aerospace forces are able to begin bombing from medium altitude, significantly increasing the accuracy of their strikes. To do this, they would need to denude Ukraine of its air defenses. I think that has to be put in the camp of complete speculation at this point. Uh, you know, in the same vein of you know that Russia next month is going to kick off an offensive that will breach 50 kilometers through the Ukrainian lines or or the Ukrainian counterattack in 6 months is going to reach the sea of Azov like we just haven't seen that we also haven't seen Russia be able to gain some degree of air superiority over the front lines so yes it would be a problem for Ukraine but i don't think uh in the near term at least that should be a major concern the the air defenses are still pretty substantial all across the front then shifting over to uh, some opportunities for Ukraine in the coming months, Watling says the winter once again poses an opportunity to maximize Russian losses. If Russian troops are drawn into the defense along a wide front, then Russian forces will be outside getting cold and wet. If targeted strikes can degrade their logistics, then the limited training and field craft of Russian forces can maximize climactic injuries. And the, the conversation about fighting in the winter was interesting last year. I'll say that. Uh, you had some people suggesting that as soon as the winter comes, the fighting's going to stop. And then others saying, why would it stop? <laughs> the, 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 a cold climate is not unique to Ukrainians, not unique to Russians. So why would they not be able to operate when the, the temperature drops a little bit? And it's true. The fighting did not stop 
in the winter. It's not going to stop this winter. Everything just takes a little bit longer. It's a little bit harder. And of course, the, the weather conditions mean that you could actually freeze to death if you're exposed to the elements for a long period of time. So the, the opportunity for Ukraine here, again, is to keep those Russian forces forward, keep them close to the front, and then using their ATACMs, HIMARS, Storm Shadows, and whatever other long-range munitions they get their hands on, uh, degrade the Russian logistics to where those troops at the front line are not getting supplied or not getting food or not getting additional warm weather clothing, anything like that. And then in wrapping up here, Watling says to set the conditions for the isolation of Crimea that is all dependent upon the armed forces of Ukraine being able to reconstitute. A couple notes there. Uh, I have started to see uh, the term isolation of Crimea used more than liberation of Crimea in the past few months. Uh, big picture, kind of maximalist goals for Ukraine is the eventual liberation of Crimea. Uh, but a step before that would be the isolation of that, you know, knocking out the bridges, knocking out the rail lines, um, keeping the Black Sea fleet in bay, things like that. We have seen a lot of that over the last few months. So it's it's moving in that direction. But again, brings it all back to the armed forces of Ukraine being able to reconstitute, being able to build those forces, being able to train those forces, equip them and move them back from the front and train them in things other than just holding the line, right? It's very easy to grab a soldier, do minimal training, send him to the front and say, hold this position and shoot the bad guys when they come towards you. But to actually train for platoon, let alone company and battalion and brigade sized operations, combined arms operations, you have to be able to pull those people from the front. And it's just going to be a balancing act for Ukraine to get those people, get the necessary people off of the front to do that training so they can effectively kick off some sort of future offensive while maintaining the pressure on Russian forces all along the front. But that's all I got for now. Of course, this article will be linked in the description below along with the national security sit reps I put out on Substack. But thanks for watching and I'll see y'all next time.